Und ich bitte das Ensemble Olivin auf die Bühne. Sinem Altan, Begüm Tüsemen und Özgür Ersoy. Ja, wir würden fortfahren mit einem weiteren spannenden Beitrag. Wir würden ein bisschen nach Anatolien reisen, und zwar von dem berühmten Epensänger und Poeten Aschik Weysel gibt es ein sehr spannendes Lied, das heißt Mein bester Freund oder meine beste Freundin oder mein Geliebter oder meine Geliebte ist nichts anderes als die schwarze Erde wo auch immer sie sich befinden mag. Und Sie hören daraus die spannende Version von Olli Bin. Viel Spaß.
Thank you very much. Hello and good evening. It is an extreme pleasure for me to spend the next hour with you talking with three interesting, experienced, courageous, tough, active, and cool experts for targeting the question, does art become more political in times of radical change? We will discuss the artist's positions and reactions to social and political change in Europe, as well as in Arabic and Balkan states. How and where do those political change influences, shapes, determine the contemporary artistic production process? And are the arts, in the end, able to take over the responsibility to fight back la grande fatigue? Please welcome with me Borka Pavicevic. Serbia. She, she is the head of the Center for Cultural Decontamination in Belgrade. Frieleisen, next to her from Belgium, who made out of the Kunsten Festival, Kunsten Festival what it is, and is actually responsible for foreign affairs much more than theater festival in Berlin that will happen this autumn. And then Aida Elturi, independent curator, producer from Egypt and founder, director of the Finding Projects Association in Cairo and Firenze. I am Adrienne Göhler, somehow uh, familiar with the Goethe Institute. Uh, the Goethe Institute, you know. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a terrible thing. Also with the Goethe Institute, but of course with the Heinrich Böll Foundation since its beginning. Borka. Yes. You have been, you were born in Kotor, Montenegro. Yes. And you graduated from the Academy for Theatre, Film, Radio and TV in Belgrade. Since then, you worked as a dramaturg and a publisher, festival maker, and you also have been part of the artist movement, Kapitigete. <laughs> this means the first letter of theatre in Croatian, Serbian, Slovenian and Macedonian language. Is that right? Yes, right. Good. In 1994, you founded the very famous Center for Cultural Decontamination in Belgrade to counteract not only the politics of Milosevic, but also all forms of nationalism, xenophobia, intolerance, hatred, and fear. And I guess also to counteract sexism, isn't it? Yeah, now we will continue. <laughs> we will continue. Hmm. You are considered from major importance for the post-war development in the cultural and theater scene in, in post-Yugoslavia. You are co-author of the book Belgrad, Mein Belgrad, and got at least three international prizes for your work. No, 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 one sentence. Oh. Until now, the center has organized more than... 2,000 performances. Why is that still this good? This is, uh, can you change it, please? That would be nice. Exhibition theater events. Uh, the center had more than 2,000 performances, exhibition theater events, protest actions, lectures. Borka lives in Belgrade. So. Festival maker Freelizen. You are considered as one of the most experienced personalities with the, within the international theater scene. A newspaper describes you as a soft spoken, steely willed curator who has been behind some of the most cutting edge festivals of the past 30 years. You can be flattered. 
also in 1994, uh, 1994 so that was a, a big um, and important year for the both of you, you founded the multidisciplinary Kunsten Festival des Arts in Belgium. She is continued to run, which is continued to run with great success for more than 10 years and which developed into one of the most influences, influential international festivals in Europe. More recently, your cultural research has concentrated on the research on the Arabic-speaking world. As a result, you curated the multidisciplinary festival Meeting Point 5 in 11 different cities, such as Rabat, Alexandria, Cairo, Amman, Tunis, Minya, Damascus, Beirut, and Ramallah, and then you brought it to Brussels and Berlin. Then in 2010, you have been the first international program director appointed by four Theater der Welt. And actually, as I told you, you are the artistic director of the International Foreign Affairs Festival. Aida, Aida Elturi. Independent curator, founder, and director of a very new organization called Finding Projects Association. And you are completing as well your master degree in Islamic art and architecture at the American University in Cairo. You have an impressive list of different activities, among others, working for the Brooklyn Museum. Elizabeth Sackler Feminist Center, Art Center, Christie's Auction House in New York, Bidoon Magazine also in New York, the Townhouse Gallery in Cairo, in Cairo and Editor-in-Chief of Contemporary Practices Journal, Dubai. You are involved in international projects with artists and cultural practitioners from the Middle East and Europe, including the Egyptian Pavilion, of the 54th International Venice Biennial last year, Manifesta 8, and the Changing Room Project, which will be part of the London Cultural Olympiad programs. And you only returned to Cairo in October 2010, early enough to be part of the revolution. I would like to start... Stefan, are you ready? I would like to start showing the work you curated at the last Venice Biennale for the Pavilion of Egypt, and then we will start. Thank you. Thank you. It's running. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Um, can we show the images first before the video? The, uh, this, uh, this is the artist Ahmed Basuni, who was killed on the third day of the revolution, on the 28th of January. And, uh, of course, the rising of the revolution in Egypt was, a, was, of course, a surprise to everyone. This was not a planned event. And, of course, as it ran through, people took it day by day. And so did this artist, who, for me, represented the everyday Egyptian man and the fight that he had to endure in order to have his voice heard. And um, just to take you through briefly the images of this man on in the streets of Tahrir Square, fully equipped, a uh, peaceful protester, physically present, talks on Facebook, telling people how to protect themselves, how to be careful. These pictures were taken by his best friend, Magdi Mustafa, who was the sound technician for his project in the Venice Biennale. Um, he was killed on the 28th for holding a video camera. He was definitely uh, triggered by a sniper. And the body was found um, a good five, six days. His family had not, could not find him for quite a while. And they, they knew something had happened. So with a huge fight done by his colleague, Shadi Noshokati, who's a big, uh, a very significant artist in Cairo and a professor of the arts, he fought very hard with the Ministry of Culture and the fine arts sector 
a few, maybe two, three months before the Venice Biennale opens to ensure that the Egyptian pavilion honors this man for the first time in its history. They honor a man in his, uh, at the age of 32 with a new media art project, a project that a type of artwork that isn't typically recognized in Egypt, that the government refuses to recognize. And so we were commissioned to produce this work. And uh, if you're familiar with the Egyptian pavilion, um, the large hall, it has existed since 1952 with the uh, abdication of the king of Egypt. And uh, we took over the hall with five screens displayed in a diagonal manner. This design was designed by Ahmed Bassouni in 2009 in a proposal he had given the Venice uh, for the Venice Biennale, and he was rejected. And then we had uh, decided to project his work, uh, 30 days of running in the place, along with the footage of the streets of Tahrir during the three days that he went down and filmed what was happening around him and the reason why he was killed. And this is his project done in 2010, 30 days of running in the place. And we'll show you some footage of this work. Very raw material. All of it was raw material. And if we could show the film. This is a performance piece that Ahmed had produced in January 2010 of a new media experiment. He was placing sensors all across his body uh, reading the levels of heat and sweat released from his body and then projected onto a, a screen, a codified screen that would read those levels in front of him. And he had performed this in, in live um, and documented it. And then one year later, we see this. And this is him going down 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th of January. We don't have footage of the 28th because he was killed that day and the camera was taken. But it is his personal footage in the street filming what was happening around him. I can't show you more than 30 seconds for the family copyright of the film. Um, but it was an extremely significant period in Egyptian history to show this type of work in Venice uh, under the circumstances. But still it's, it's quite uh, astonishing that the government in the end would agree uh, yeah. to let that pass in, uh, in it, it certainly, Venice. It certainly was a huge fight uh, run by the, the group of artists who were all the supporters of this artist. And also it was in the best interest of the government to project a new image of Egypt. So to some extent it was in their best benefit to do that, to project to the world that they are changing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, can you maybe tell us also a bit about the Finding Project um, Association? Uh, why did you? What was the circumstances under you? You started that project, and what is the project uh, standing for? Well, Finding Project acts as a, a space designed to react to anything happening at that time. Um, it is to break a, the monopoly that controls the art world, a monopoly that will only service a community or a clique of artists or art cultures instead of actually serving a cause that is actually active during the time it is happening. So um, the Changing Room is one of those projects that happened in Torino and now happening in London. Um, another project was with Manifesta when we had done... Uh, a screening of the relationship of the Mediterranean and Arab world in 2010. We do a lot of projects in the Emirates in Sharjah where we're documenting uh, (coughs) Arab video art, the importance of video art, the importance of documentation, the importance of short films with the Maraya Art Center. So there are, uh, it acts as this, as a movement that isn't tied down to a space, but it's tied by the the people who push it forward. As our general subject is, um, do arts change in times of radical political uh, change? Um, I have some quotes from a discussion you also had in in Cairo University. 
uh, where it was very clearly spoken out that social critique and social justice is in art nowadays in a relevant topic. Caricature, we saw it in the beginning, and we will see it all uh, the t- next two days. Caricature or cartoon can be particularly effective in delivering a critical message by passing it through a love, it's called. And in this moment in Egyptian history, a communicate a communicative kind of art is needed. This was uh, pointed out on this discussion. Would you say you have in the moment somehow a collective or um, a communicative kind of, of, of the arts? I mean, you, you mentioned that the, the arts in, in Egypt were a kind of elistic, elitic, uh, little group and now once it went or it comes from the streets it uh, certainly like if we're if we're talking about uh, the relationship of activism and fatigue as we had discussed yesterday uh, the whole uprising was a re- it was a result of fatigue it was a result of, a, of an entire society an entire maybe region exhausted from the treatment exhausted from the being disregarded during the 18 days in Cairo the artists went down to the square like Ahmed Basuni had no idea what to expect and were filming were documenting, were taking in as much information as they possibly can and were being sure that they had to be there to protest peacefully, to make sure their demands are heard and to help anyone who needs help and instead they got fired at and they were resisted brutally. Now Post the 18 days, Mubarak steps down. You have this situation where, all right, the army's out in the streets. We haven't seen this since maybe 1973. It's a new image in our streets. The army, the tanks, this this powerful body that is also very uh, delusional. We are not sure if they're with us or against us, but we hope they are with us and we encourage them to be with us. But we're also questioning We have no idea. And again, the artists are not yet artists. The artists have become citizens. And the citizens have become the artists. They're the ones who are writing the signages. They're the ones who are reacting to everything happening around them. And they unite as citizens. Now, we have a small group that formed in that square. And they're called the Young Artists Coalition. They were very few, maybe they started out with 10 or 15 people who would walk into the square with buckets of paint and paintbrushes and it would cross through Tahrir, get to the right spot that would be best for them to start painting. And they would start painting and talk to people and talk to them about what do they want to talk about and start involving the community in painting with them, looking at paint as a peaceful tool. It came across during those 18 days where they started to paint on the streets of Tahrir, not on the walls, but on the actual tarmac of the floors. And that grew and grew and grew until that went into Talat Harba Square, which is the square where the national, the wing of the National Democratic Party exists. And they took over that square during uh, from 5 a.m. till 7 a.m. Uh, in February, um, right after Mubarak had stepped down. And of course, all the all the streets were monitored by the army, and they had to monitor when the army was not observing, even though they would still be documented by cameras. But this was again uh, an, a a need, a desire that they had to leave a mark that was not like the graffiti work that we see now. It was extremely peaceful, and it wasn't about statements. It was about ensuring that we're here for a peaceful existence. We remind you, we are your people. We remind you that we're here in a peaceful manner. And this group, until this day, have formulated a group of 60 artists. It's strictly an art team. And this Young Art Coalition has gone into the neighborhoods, very poor neighborhoods, and taken over the streets in Cairo, involving the community into painting their stories on their walls. And it's it's an amazing project. It's called Hekayat Gadar, it's called um, which means wall stories, and they have fully integrated the community that they're in. And the first one is in Baba, an area called Azbet Saida, which was one of the areas that was accused of having all the um, the thugs that were attacking the people, which was not true. 
Of course, the police wanted to blame anyone but themselves. Uh, a lot of robberies, a lot of any excuse of any disaster, they would blame it on these impoverished areas who had nothing to do with the attacks that were going on. All of this was instigated by higher authorities. So they went into the neighborhood and they say, listen, we're here. We want to talk to you and we want to tell your stories to the world. So we must paint your stories on your walls. When the police tried to enter the street, they tried to enter to delete their walls. They said, you cannot delete our walls. This is not a public space. This is our wall. This is our building. You cannot enter. And that resistance alone was enough for the police to know that they could not cross certain grounds. So this group are still working until this day very well. Um, the main artists are Ibrahim Saad, uh, who is a, who is a, a fine artist, um, Mustafa al Banna. Uh, Amr Amir, Osama Abdel Menam, a, a group of young artists, and they have curated a show in January at the Saad Zaghloul Cultural Center called Shift Delete 30, talking about the deletion of the past 30 years. Of course, Saad Zaghloul is the emblem of the 1919 revolution, so they took over a government building in order to install works that criticized 30 years of, of desperation, of rejection. And they're now working on a show opening up in June, on the 20th of June, called Supermarket, which will also be in one of the government institutions and supported by the government, even though they still don't know what the material will be. But <laughs> this is, this Supermarket is a, is a very nice uh, word. Uh, thank you very much, Aida. Uh, I think we will, we will come back to you and to the situation Borka, what uh, reminds you a lot of things I can imagine? Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for everything I can hear today from the colleagues and friends from Arabic countries. But I want to say something. If you notice, in, uh, there were three men before here, and they discussed politics, and this was fulfilled. And everybody were shouting. And now we are talking about the culture. We are four women, and there is more women here, and there is nobody shouting. You know, this is also the, the subject in which, uh, yes, you said right uh, a few minutes ago to be, uh, to be uh, let's say, uh, with a certain problems with nationalism. That means to be uh, uh, with a certain problem with realistic art with a certain problem in, uh, with a man's society. And uh, that all goes together, actually, from the culture and from the art you can see, uh, from the body language to further to the war, from the body language, how the man behave to the war. This is a shortcut, and then you can show it in the dance. I mean, and that, that was the art has to do something uh, against the nationalism and totalitarianism. And as I heard before, those three men were speaking a lot of about dictatorship, and then they were mentioning Hitler, Stalin, and so on. I could not understand everything in German. But what I may say it is that what I catch is that uh, religious possession can be also ideological possession. So the Stalin could not be the necessarily uh, religious, but he was theologist. Even he was a priest, by the way. I mean, this was a mistake. He was very religious. And he's were converted, you know. So this is the totalitarian or theological way of thinking, whatever it is uh, a question. Is Europe secular or not? That is the long discussion. But what I want to say, and then we will see some pictures from the center, you now can move the Heinrich Bell Foundation and yeah, yeah. The, for the minute for the minute and I just want to show something uh, uh, yeah, this is the site yeah okay but then we have some images that you can just uh, get the idea but there is something on the beginning uh, uh, some video but doesn't matter I mean this is uh, anyhow um uh, now it's always so in technic, yes. Yes. This is, for example, outside performances. But you can move it a little bit quicker. And I, uh, I will just uh, have a little... This is Wish for Life, uh, the performance dedicated to the philosopher Wilhelm Reich with his organic energy. 
Yeah, and then uh, j- just I will um, say a few words, and this is uh, this is the beginning, my dear, of uh, uh, taking public place as uh, as um, Aida. This is the first how you can how the malls are entering after the revolution. First, you have authoritarian regime. Then we get rid of authoritarian regime. Then you get then then you get oligarchy regime. And the first sign of expropriation of the public space is to build cell service. So we have now churches and malls. You know, we have religion, and and that's the story. This is just one from the performance which I'm making outside. Can you do this quite show a little bit quicker? Okay, uh, uh, the center, uh, uh, the, um, we are working for almost 70 years since it's in the middle of the Belgrade, and it has a very beautiful yard. It's actually the first artistic pavilion ever built on Balkan. And it puts the question of continuity and discontinuity of the culture. So, I mean, in that space and um, in the yard we have, that the, is outside space, we actually, and we are doing performances in the city. Uh, th- this is actually how it uh, looks. And then we are, pro- this is a pornography. This is also the part of nationalism and pornographical kitsch which come with the dictatorship. I mean, but this is uh, uh, um, actually the, the theater production and this is uh, something what we call a personal gesture. Nobody knows what it is. But there are the the better in producing is when this is something you what you should name. I mean so very often you don't know actually what a genre it is but uh, uh, this is that what is the gesture and of course the uh, the polemics the discussion the questions of human rights uh, transitional justice in let's say serbian very complicated situation now serbia serbian but before it was of course yugoslav um and this is actually the subject uh, um, before the so democratic changings. We were, of course, uh, uh, culture opposition uh, because uh, that was. Uh, you did always theater against all kind of regimes. You know, I, uh, the culture is subversive. And the theater is subversive, and the art is critical, and and yes, it is so. I mean, it is not only against; it is uh, it the uh, producing in our circumstances now means to be subversive because nobody is producing. Other is agriculture. Other, other way is culture. Everybody are trafficking in so-called transitional country. So to produce is the first act of authorship and critical and, um, and affirmation. And if you ask me about um, that what Aida would say, I mean you have apathy or you have empathy. You have uh, um, and this In is the, the arts. P- you talk now uh, about the arts, right? Yes. You can you, be totally or, apathetic. Or, yeah. you, yeah. right. or, or you can feel uh, empathy. And this is catharsic in art. For example, this is an exhibition mm. about, the, about the homeless people. And usually you remember, in so, you, you don't remember, but maybe somebody remember uh, in um, public space you always have important persons. Uh, Stalin, Hitler, and all the Assad, and all the people, My Milosevic, God, so who are mentioned. And instead today. of that we put an, one homeless yeah. on the place where the very important people are, usually. And... Um, um, that it means um, in some way empathy is also the way to uh, to cross the fear to deliberate the, the your surrounding can you tell us a bit more about because some of um, our our guests or public will not uh, remember this time so so well um, how was it in the beginning I mean when all this this war started uh, in Balkan where what was the artists did they did they move 
in the in the same second Adrian did they I mean because you know it was so so wonderful how Aida described it and I think you must have incredible memories uh, and the memorization is subversive also now the uh, the the it, no one government like the people who are witnessing and who remember and all everything is working against the remembering and this is from Joyce and Proust till today i mean and uh, actually this was a huge theater exhi- exhibition about uh, the founder of Beatles the question is uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the question is how, um, actually, uh, what you say, the revolution. No, it's not true. The, some part of the artists and uh, writers especially, because writing very often means narrative, epic. And many of them at the beginning of Yugoslav war entered the nationalistic race. You know, to contestate and to hypostasy to count, to, 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 to write with, for, to move the people in a, in a nationalistic procedure. So, but there were the people who were against that. And this is actually so-called second. This is our civilian activity. What Aida mentioned, citizen and artist. Because at the big end of, during the war, the people become troops, groups, parties, uh, and with that, and yes, those. and the nations, the nations, and with the coming of the nations, it comes ethnical cleansing. And I lived in the country of 20 million people, in which the four million are exiled or moved through this war. And now the, the, that what it is civilian, what rest, this is a subject to. And those people actually want to be free. Especially because in now democratic circumstances, we, this is a certain partocracy. Now the people are not in troops, in groups, now they are in parties. Partocrati. Yes, that ah, means to be subordinated. Today. And yeah, this right. is a way of democracy in so-called transitional country, what you can follow, because the, on the West nobody transit in any way. But on the East, so-called Eastern Europe, is transi- in transition, but nobody knows where and how. So that is, uh, that's actually, stop that please. <laughs> yes, this was a very big scandal with that uh, performance, uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, what uh, we had an election now, so uh, uh, this democracy, unfortunately, because it was not enough illustrations, what you from the Eastern German who are here very know, well know what is the illustration, and what is uh, uh, the clarification of a previous regime that has not been done. So in some way we have uh, those uh, right-wing um, organizations. So art, art is not good and art is not left, but art can also be completely on the side of power. Yes, of course. And uh, of propaganda. Yes, right? of course. And uh, what would you, is there any any important thing you need to say to Aida? I mean, in, uh, in terms of, uh, please don't make yes, the same mistake. In some <laughs> way, yes. That we spent, I spent on the street from 91 till 2000. I mean, I spent on the street 10 years. And 10 years we were doing the demos, first uh, demonstrations against the war in Yugoslavia, against the killing Croats, Muslim, and all the others. And we had a street art, and we had uh, 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 performing in front of the police and all of that. And then we had a democratic change. The big riot, and Milosevic was moved and moved to Hague. And he was arrested and left to Hague. And now we have a 10 years between you and me. There are the 10 years of democracy. And what kind, what is the meaning 
how the revolution can become a state. And of course, when you have a revolution from Lev, from the Soviet revolution, from the beginning of century with Mayakovsky, Malevich, Tatlin, you had the biggest artistic revolution. But then when you form the strait, we started with Selyonovich, they all went to concentration camps, to gulags. And you have one of the best uh, uh, part of the uh, Europe history of art. You have a German expressionist and you have a Weimar Republic, but then you have a Hitler. So it means uh, the, the, uh, the, what I'm thinking, this is between a revolution and constitution, between the destruction and critique and affirmation. Uh, this is actually the field of art. That means the, how, how to be critical and to create in the same time. That, that is just, anyhow, I'm older, but you, uh, and what I want to say is that, uh, that what you brought in Europe, that is, uh, that what's happened in Arabic, the democratic change, which is no, nobody expects that. But you changed our attitudes and the attitudes of all, all world concerned the democratic movement. And this is important what is going on today. Because this is the new, con, new, new part of the world, new understanding and new fight for the democracy. And in that sense, you already change. Uh, the Europe and the rest of the world. And, 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 and I will finish. Sorry? And what is, I will finish. <laughs> and actually brought something that we ask today ourselves, what are the ways to, in the mi- in the middle of crisis, in the middle of economic shock, how we will find somehow a way to live all of us nine milli- milliard in five, five years on we have to we find a lot of uh, the new ideas you actually brought in. This inspiration is enormous, and I don't think that it is concerning those guys before only about uh, uh, Islam and... Uh, um, well, it uh, were window, who is, window yeah, speeches. Yes, yes. We decided Sorry. to sit here in a sort of, in a sort of kitchen table. Unfortunately, the four of us are heavy smokers. We would love to smoke, but we know we are not allowed. You know, I mean, it's not that exactly the kitchen Adriana, table. Because yes, yes. if we four would sit in a kitchen table, that would be a lot of free. Please, uh, can I just because uh, free? I think you we are listening to to these both approaches, histories. Of course, you you know a lot of the, of them. Just give us a bit your idea what what is going in your round your head about art in times of radical. Oh, there is so much has been said, and uh, I mean um, it's difficult to react coming from a very peaceful, boring country, uh, Belgium, where nothing is happening. And working in Germany where not much is happening. So, but I have a few uh, reflections to make. First of all, um, of course we live in places where nothing, not much is happening. I'm not saying not is, nothing is happening. But extreme situations ask for extreme reactions. War situations ask for extreme Reactions also from artists who, as you said correctly, are citizens. The, the question for me also is what, what is the position of artists when the situations are not extreme and in what way can artists contribute to point out the, 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 the sick parts in the society so that, um, situation doesn't become so bad that it needs revolutions or that it needs wars. So um, yeah, I think for me that is a, a very, very uh, important question. I, uh, I agree with you that artists are uh, subversive. I think in Europe uh, most of the artists has become entertainment and is not subversive at all anymore. 
um, what is, what a is second. The for, what is the reason for that? Because it's no emergency. Because we love to please. We love to please the audience. We love to please, please the politicians. We need the money from them. We love to please, and that's not the role. I think I agree with you. The arts is uh, is on the other side of the barrier and should question and criticize society. That's that's what uh, the role of the arts is. But we want to please, and it's. <coughs> Of course, more comfortable to, because also ministers or politicians cannot judge the the value of the work, so they can't count the heads. And if you have a big audience, it's fine. So that's uh, and we play. I mean, it takes two to tango. We're all responsible for that. Also, it's not just the other side; it's also us. A second question that comes to my head all the time when I hear you both talk is. The West is still very imperialistic, and um, we look at these wars, and I'm sorry to say so, but the West loves to see this. We love it. We love war somewhere else. We love poverty somewhere else. We love misery somewhere else. We love it because it confirms our right that we are our right. Concept. And I think... I'm also really worried when you see these new democracies coming up, what kind of democracies will they be? A copy of ours will never work. But we now think, with as good imperialists, aha, the Arab uh, uprisal, aha, Eastern Europe, they will become like us. And I think it's another mistake because this is, this is not going to work. But, um, is is the the arts are the arts the counterpart for that possibly counterpart uh, to fight that idea of westernization back or is it I mean art is also in in this context I mean we will uh, maybe now uh, it should be the third round but we can uh, throw it now already in the debate everybody your work your work is depending from the goodwill of Western uh, foundings being uh, totally, totally amazed and encouraged by the process of the arts in your country. That's the, that's the dangerous cocktail. I know. We have, we <laughs> have, we have the monopoly of, yeah. of uh, moral values and we have the money. What kind of discussion do we have with other parts of the world? We, I have the monopoly of the value and I have the portemonnaie. I have the money. So how can we talk now? So we go. If we don't have to talk, what, what, I mean, how can we, how can we face that uh, in a, in a clever, intelligent way, that danger? I mean, the, it would be very important that you get money From your, yesterday you said, since yesterday you have, you are back to dictatorship. Um, so uh, in some way in, in your country, and uh, what about financement from your governments, which would be, of course, uh, one step to fight the overall ideology of Western standards, economically, financially, and also uh, Uh, all kinds, I mean, all, all our arts are, of course, somehow in concerning recognition, funding, and you wrote that in, uh, in uh, Meeting Point uh, five and circulation of uh, art is in the hands of Western curators, Western definition givers, and Western money. That, that's extremely true, and that's the biggest struggle in Egypt um, and probably other places in the Arab world. You have an amazing rise happening in the Gulf, which, of course, is the art scene, which is very rich, very able to create projects, uh, a Braj Prize being one of the most prestigious prizes that really do support art, artists who are accepted and welcomed into winning a prize from there. 
but it is also part of the jargon that we are talking about, which is the struggle of art being for the wealth and not being for the actual reaching of cultures or reaching of communities. Because Dubai, we have to face it, is a very commercial center. And uh, Shara'a is much more cultured, and it has an incredible foundation there, and it's creating a huge movement. But Shara'a is not the center of the art world Dubai is. Qatar is a rising body, and Qatar is creating an amazing center for the education of the arts through the museum uh, that they've created and the universities that they have. Bahrain is, again, a commercial center, but not as rich as, of course, Dubai. Dubai is still the center because, of course, in Abu Dhabi is supposed to be building three museums, uh, all Western. Louvre, Guggenheim are not Arab. And so there is a fight. Will those happen or not? And if they happen, on what basis is their selection criteria? How are they going to select Arab artists? Who's going to be their monopolizing connection of selecting XYZ artists as opposed to studying critically the type of art movement that's happening and why, if I choose this artist, should he be in my collection? It's a huge struggle to get funding from inside the region inside your own country, inside from your own government in Egypt, that's almost an impossibility, as opposed to actually going to the Goethe Institute in Cairo, going to Prohlvetia, creating some sort of a collaborative project between Germany and Switzerland, or going to the British Council, creating something between or in Egypt or in London, and yes, you will get a good sum of money. And you will get some good support and you'll get recognition if you are working in something that will stand out, will be significant. But another huge problem, and this is what we do, what we try to help in, artists do not write in English. They do not write English fluently. They do not know how to express their idea in paper. Even if they write it in Arabic, it tends to drop. For the funder, the funder is looking for a certain language with a very good vocabulary, with select words that will really, you know, hit them the and say, words. ha, the keywords. The key words. We, have to, we have to help use those magic words and get them to Do you know how this, this is working here in Germany? Because don't think that uh, German artists are better in, in English um, and better in understanding the conditions to get money from European uh, from European funding, uh, nobody I know knows it, but there are now offices of specialists understanding that that keyword English and also the words they need to understand what we would never This be able... This is not the question of the keywords. This is exactly what Ari Fromm said. This is the society in e- equality is bought for anything. I mean, this is a deeper procedure because this this is a mediocrity treatment of every authorship, you know. And I can repeat you by days. I have a young younger uh, co- colleagues which are involved in that. So I read that the containers of the freedom are inside of instruction of implementation. At first, it's everywhere written implementation. And I said, I am not implementing anything. I'm just making something. I mean, what? And this language shows you this is the new Orwellian actually language in which the sense is vanishing like from the... And this is now the question of uh, the next, uh, next authorship. And what Aida said is, uh, yes, uh, of course, that you have uh, the creation minister of culture, a uh, friend, Andrea Heldman, says, everything what was done seriously in the last 20 years from the separation in Yugoslavia on the level of culture was done by the non-official production. Because the National Theatre will repeat all these battles and battles and battles. The National Library will, you know, this is the, actually, everything, but because you have no money, and the work is on the another way, you got an extremely uh, capable staffs 
We can produce with the 10 people what you need the hundreds people in the official institution. And now when you have economical crisis, that the, the, those institutions are going to hell. And actually, uh, we are in some good situation because we know how to... Uh, I mean, there are young people who are speaking five fourth languages. There is no ten secretaries. There is no all this, especially in um, transitional country. When you have a rest of socialistic bureaucracy, and now they switch to the European bureaucracy. So it's in Belgrade. Everybody are going to say, we don't think so. But this is the order from Brussels. Well, but this is the general excuse now for everybody, the order from Brussels, because I tell you again, half of, I mean, all people I know, nobody understands this language, and everybody says, well, this is the new, uh, the new European talk. And of course, it is about globalizing the administrative <coughs> system, the Western administrative system. I think this is one of the, the biggest um, Challenges, but please, free you are. You are no, I was saying the difference is that for us Europeans, if we cannot make these applications, we don't we survive perfectly well. In other parts of the world, without this money, they don't survive at all, and that's the big difference. The second thing is when I was doing this festival in the Arab countries. Um, The whole budget came from Goethe Institute, British Council, Institut Francais, blah, 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 blah. And I was pissed with them. I thought, what are you doing here? What is your task? To bring Molière here again and, and to make a Shakespeare with the Shake, National Shakespeare Company? But I was pissed with them, but at the other hand, there is no alternative. If they don't do it, and for me it's still the remains of colonialism, but if they don't invest in, in the arts, the, the local regimes don't. They put a lot of money. The budget for culture in Egypt is huge, but it goes to, to very, the big opera houses, the big ballets, the big orchestra. There's a lot of money. But there is no political interest in, um, in, in the more independent artists who are critical and subversive. But this has to change, because if we go on, we just continue to import export the western standards what is happening in dubai i mean we are just all the artists not all but most of the artists in the arab world have been studying in the west the lebanese come from france uh, you have uh, american university it is the western standards that are exported And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. Did you have any any uh, rencontre with the guy from uh, from these Arab countries where you were traveling and where you were ex giving uh, lectures and having performances? Did you ever talk to any of these official money giving persons from the cultural side? From the local government? Yeah. No, because we had to go clandestine, in fact. And with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the big cultural institutions from Europe, it was okay, but they say they use too much fuck, say, fuck in this text. That doesn't work here. So uh, then you have this kind of censorship from all the sides. Um, but this is something that has to, I don't know how this cultural institute should responsabilize, respond make responsible the local governments because like this the system is not going anywhere it is just spreading the western standards and the western way of thinking and the western aesthetics and the western um, sensitivity and so on and we are killing a lot of local cultures I, I, actually, what? I have something that's very true, and actually the biggest problem is that we don't have any private funding. There's no local private funding. We have a lot of rich people. They do not put a penny in the arts. They say, oh, it would be nice to go to an art show. It would be nice to go to the opera house. Whatever it is, they're sitting on a shitload of money, and no one is doing anything towards the arts and culture because... Simply, there is no educational understanding of how important it is to have art and culture in your country seen. 
visible, reached, whether abroad or locally, to know that there are Egyptian artists, to know that they exist, to know how active they are, to know what their life is like, to know how they live on a daily basis, to know how many jobs they hold to survive being an artist. And the jobs that they hold have nothing to do with the art that they do. So to have that, um, there was a sentence I had read in our program mm. where to have art is to understand life and people do not understand that. They don't get it. We have corporations. No one gives money from corporate social responsibility. I'd like to see Vodafone come and sponsor a local artist. Vodafone is making a lot of money from our phone calls, a hell of a lot of money. So not I one penny Vodafone, is put in. Vodafone is a bad alternative for governments, you know. But it's private. It's private. Look at America. It's all funded with private money. Mm -hmm. And all the artists of contemporary art survive thanks to Europe. Yeah. None of these artists are supported by private money. Forget the private money. Let car makers make their cars and telephone makers make their telephones. We pay taxes to the government to we don't, have we cultural don't money. Taxes. We don't know how to pay our taxes. Yeah, but maybe this is also the, the, the other side the of, the, of the coin that you have to maybe you have to contribute to uh, to, to public affairs that are run by a government. But certainly not the car makers and the telephone makers. Don't make them the Ministry of Culture. <laughs> Uh, okay, but what about uh, having it from different levels and from different uh, corners? Because, you know, it's also a bit cynical to say, just can you maybe just change the system in order to get taxes and everything? This will take ages, yeah? And this is a kind of cynicism. Uh, uh, I would love to to know more how how can the new image of an artist who is also an activist. I think this is all you can see here. In uh, You go outside and the next two days it's all about the double meaning that artists are activists and activists use art and this is another form of um, yeah, of co coincidence. No, it's not coincidence. What is that word? Of collaboration, of collaboration, uh, which is, I would say, also for Europe relatively new. That uh, European artists go out of the white cube, that they uh, not only mix uh, all kinds of media, but also they go in, in very different places and they take again the public space and the street as. Uh, as a, a kind of stage. So how could we go we, how could we go on with this type? Because I think this is the the most or maybe the the best help uh, against artists being totally in um, totally away from the society. And that you as artists and activists can hopefully fight more intensely than separated? What do you think? What, what do you mean fight more intensely than separated? Well, if you, we have all, this is a, um, of course um, experience we have in, in Germany. Artists fight for artists' uh, reasons and artists' budget and artists' uh, uh, artists places and artists, artists, artists. It's always me and the art. And then you have the social activists who fight for totally different things. And I have the idea, neither in the Balkan nor in your country, it was so totally divided, but that of course artists fight for no, another society art and political are the same place and this is the problem of the public yesterday we saw yes. this airport you brought yes. us the Berlin Temple. airport yeah I mean, and the question is, you have so many, um, uh, uh, actually the whole public space is pr privatized. Uh, the, 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 whatever it is, it is a privatized space. So that the city, the tourists, the citizens, you will have more, and you have an enormous so social separation. So 
very soon, I mean, the inhabitants or the citizens will be inside of their houses under the control of uh, control system and uh, security, and who is only in the public uh, uh, space, the strangers. The strangers are strolling. The, the you know, tourists, the, tourists the, dead, yes. the dead cities where the tourists yes. are the only exactly. open spacer. Yes. I mean, but this is definitely not the... <laughs> not, not the case. No. Not the case in, uh, in Cairo. And I would, because we... Ne- <laughs> we only have f- five minutes, I was told, and now... I need a strong, I know, know a strong uh, sentence from the three of you because, you know, art in times of radical change is our subject and um, we have to leave the floor soon to a next floor. And, um, well, we, we had already some kind of suggestions from your side, but... Anyway, Ida, what what is your ideas? The next, uh, where where are the next steps for the arts, and what can be contribute from <coughs> people like the two of them uh, without having the idea of the old <coughs> and the new colonialism is coming to Egypt, going to the supermarket and say we buy this graffiti. And uh, we buy this artist, and we take this uh, little nice video. What what is your idea? Well, I'm starting. Um, we're, we'll try this one. I'm starting to work with uh, a collector for the arts and someone who brings awareness to the artist, to their conditions, to their work, to their life. And through that, they sell to people who like to collect art and who like to recognize artists, which will be able to invest in their living and from that and we're talking strictly local people from that we're trying to continue to bring awareness continue to make an understanding of the culture understanding of the movement um, and understanding of the artist's own well-being and that's it and we see how that goes but um, as far as Cairo is concerned we have to keep being dependable on such institutions of British Council and Swiss arts and all these other institutions because we have no other option and the government until we start paying our taxes and until they actually stop lying to us we can actually pay our taxes knowing that our taxes are putting in the right place but really we they owe us the money up till today we haven't seen our any investment done for our own country's good to be invested in our country so until that fight is fought and won. This is not a revolution, it's an uprising. And I hope it won't take 10 years in killing or the continuous murders of Syria, but um, that's the only way to go. We had a lie happen today where apparently Mubarak was sentenced for life, him and Adli, but all the ones who actually murdered along with their order were released freedom. And our two elected presidents, the ones that were supposed to go elect, are the two. One is the biggest liar and the other is the biggest thief. And apparently we're supposed to choose one or the other. So they're going to keep lying and we're going to keep yelling and screaming and fighting and killing and getting killed or whatever it is that we can do. Of course, we won't kill because we have never been able to kill anyone till this day. But with the massacres that have been done on the Egyptian people, uh, the artists have a huge role in this political movement. Their role is voicing, making sure they're heard loud and clear, one of whom is with us, Ammar, uh, who is working on his graffiti piece here in Berlin, but he is maybe one of the most representable graffiti artists in the heart of downtown. So until that is heard loud and clear and everything is exposed and a real trial is done, nothing nothing will be fixed. (coughs) That's reality we can accept. I think this was... Huh? Was that a good moment to to close the floor? Thank you. You have been a very nice public. We couldn't have the time to give the micro to the floor because 
so sorry, but we go smoke now and we can talk with you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>